Good morning. We welcome you all here this morning, this beautiful, nice, cool, dry air morning. Ooh, it's such, it's such a refreshment after all that hot, humid stuff. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, uh, hopefully it doesn't come back. I'm ready for snow. <laughs> I, I know, see, see, I told you they could throw me out. <laughs> Go, bring on the snow, no. <laughs> well, anyway, it's good for us to be here because the good Lord has asked us to be here so that we can open ourselves to the divine presence, that power that moves through our lives. And so we take a few moments to read these words uh, responsively that uh, originated with the psalmist so long ago. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For he will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me on a high rock. Well, ye shall sing now and make melody as we join our voices in singing immortal, invisible, God only one.
We come into thy presence, almighty God, that we might have that light shining upon us, shining into us, and making us a source of light. Help us today to see that which is veiled beyond the light that we can perceive to the essence of your glory and the might of your power, O Lord. For it is that power and that glory that we praise as we come together to know that we are your people, the people you have chosen to be here and to be in ministry to this place. We ask that our hearts be open and lifted up and that all who are within our hearing may be blessed by our praise. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Oh, shall we pray together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We read this morning's psalm, uh, taken from Psalm 46. Uh, responsively, the verses from 1 to 7 are our focus. God is a refuge, and is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is the witness of the city, it shall not be moved. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Amen. Let's greet each other. Handshakes, hugs, waves to our virtual congregation there. Good morning, everybody. Yes. There we go. All right. Uh, announcements. It seems to be there are a few here that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, let's do uh, the thank you card that comes from St. Mary the Bay Food Pantry, uh, which I believe you've been sending food down to. They say, thank you very much for your food donation. It really helps. And we know it does. There's a lot of hungry people out there. Uh, next week, after church, there is an all-members meeting, so uh, make plans to be there and add your voice to uh, the conversation and to the decisions that uh, are uh, so necessary for us to make together. The thrift shop will be holding its final closing sale. How long has the, the Lion's Den been operating long time Mo longer than most of us can remember it seems <laughs> okay so uh, it's uh, got a long history but it's it's too bad that uh, that particular project is uh, coming to its end I'm sure the good Lord will pop something else up for us. Missions, the Heifer Water Project uh, has a goal of $750 and uh, seems like some of that has been raised 
And uh, also, we continue to collect uh, food for the pantry at St. Mary's of the Bay. Savers Fun Drive. During your spring cleaning, set aside clothes to be donated. If I set aside clothes in my closet, they should be just taken away. <laughs> I, I don't think they're <laughs> donatable these days. Uh, a collection date will uh, be announced later. And uh, we're putting uh, our offering still in the plate at the top of the stairs. Is there anything else that needs to be brought to our attention this morning? You need help? And what do you need help for? Oh, for the sale. Okay. I didn't quite get that connection. I mean, we all need some kind of help, you know. <laughs> well, it's true. So. Yes, wait. Okay, there we go. All righty, now it is time for us to make our offerings to God, if you haven't written a check yet, uh, or if you haven't decided how much time, or how much prayer you will spend. All of these things go as praise to the Almighty who calls us to this ministry. We send up our thanksgivings to you, almighty God. For from you comes our very being, the very breath in our lungs, the smile on our face, the hope in our hearts. All that we have, all that we enjoy is from your bounty, Lord. And so with grateful hearts, we give 
our willingness to be a part of your kingdom, to serve each other, to praise your name, to share persuasively the gospel message. And so all of these things are our grateful thanksgiving to you, Lord, for all that you have done for us and all that you will do. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's see. There's another hymn here, The Church Within Us. Uh, you're getting my favorite hymns here, so I like this one. Uh, so let's sing together, main standing. There's a church within us, O Lord.
This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. The servant, a light to the nations. Here is my servant, who I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlines waiting for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes up from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The psalm that we uh, used this morning in our worship was a song of celebration to commemorate the Lord's victory for the Lord's people in chaotic times. Seems appropriate to us today. It was a psalm that uh, did two things historically. It inspired Martin Luther's uh, wonderful hymn, A Mighty Fortress. It also provides us with an image that St. Augustine used many years later, the city of God. The city of God is this place where we all want to live. But Augustine contrasts it with the city of humans down here. We'll get to that in a moment. Isaiah 42, the prophet... Uh, Isaiah is one of the most influential of all the prophets in uh, the formation of early Christianity. It was one that was identified uh, uh, almost immediately with the Messiah, with Christ. Uh, but uh, scholars who are more Old Testament oriented sees this suffering servant, the one who will not bend even though uh, he is attacked, as a corporate witness, as a corporate entity. The whole nation of Israel is to be that suffering servant. It moves us away from a purely individualistic theology, which has its limitations. It's also very prophetic in that it identifies very clearly issues of social justice the prisoners, the blind, the people who are in darkness. It encourages us to listen to the teaching of this servant so that we can understand the servant as an exemplary community. And light, as an image in this uh, psalm, reveals God's purposes. We are to be the ones who are engaged, we, all of us, doing justice, practicing kindness, and walking humbly with Almighty God. And then we get, uh, in a few moments, we're going to get to Matthew 5, 14. And uh, that comes from the Synoptic Gospels. And the Synoptic Gospels uh, present Jesus' teaching in two formats. In Matthew, it's the Sermon on the Mount, 
And in Luke, it's a sermon on the plain, but these are a collection of, of things that the early followers remembered and uh, then placed in the gospel so that it would parallel Moses. As Jesus, as Moses gave the first law from Sinai, Jesus now produces the new covenant from the mount upon which he sits. The light of faith that's to be shared by the people who listen to him there is to be shared as, again, corporate witnesses. All of us are to go out and be in relationship to the poor, the powerful, uh, those who are lost, as well as those who are found. It is a relational ministry to which we are called. And here we get that uh, image, too, of the city on the hill, the lamp on a lamp stand. The city on the hill is an image that has been used in American history from the time of John Winthrop when he wrote it in his uh, uh, early sermon, uh, all the way down to our current president, Biden, that we have appropriated this uh, image as applying to America but originally it was given to the faith community, to the followers of Jesus, to be the city on the hill, the lamp upon the lampstand. I'll have more to say about that in the sermon. Where are we here? Silent meditation. Here in this place, Almighty God, we sit and ponder the mysteriousness of your presence, the impact of your power, 
we sit and we begin to think, how do we respond to the many challenges that surround us in our world? As we think the pandemic is beginning to diminish, the variants raise new concerns. As we see people struggling to pass laws that help our most vulnerable people, our, the disadvantaged population, we see others that prepare laws to keep them from being a part of the decision-making of our nation. We see people who deprecate our faith and relegate it to that which is old and irrelevant. But everywhere, Lord, we sense the human need of your love, your grace, and your presence. We come today to continue our lives of praise, to be fortified and empowered in our service to each other and to our neighbors. Wherever we see the need, we attempt a response that raises up those who are cast down. Give strength to those who are feeble. Help us to be your agents, not simply as individuals, but as a congregation. That all who see this building and see the people within it, see that you are present in our lives. It is your power, your light that moves through us and into the world to break the power of darkness. Help us today understand at an ever-increasingly deep level the faith that stands us upon a rock, the faith that lifts our hands up, that tunes our eyes to the future. Help us today, Lord, be better than we were yesterday. Help us today, Lord, to be prepared for the days that are to come. Let us not shrink from challenges, but let us engage in the heavy work of doing your ministry and establishing your kingdom. For those who are sick, we ask your grace and mercy. For those who are caring for the sick, the doctors and the nurses, the first responders, we ask that you give them endurance as they yet again find the limits of their ability to house and care for the sick. Help us to remember the leaders of our country and pray for them so that in their hearts and in their minds, Lord, you might open them to the kingdom of love and compassion, that kingdom which we strive for. For those who are lost, we ask that somebody find them, somebody loving and compassionate, find them and lift them up and return them to the fold where together we can heal and strengthen them. Help us in our own struggles with faith against unfaith, with courage against uncourage. Help us today, Lord, be the people whom you have called to be the Baptist Church in Warren. We ask all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We put this one in there. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know this song. And if you are so inclined, clap your hands. So, maestro.
And that just never fails to get me up and going. So, yes, and where does that come from? It comes from this passage, and that's why we put it together. There's joy in letting your light shine. Matthew says to us, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel. Those are some verses that weren't in there. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna, oh, never mind. But no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's see if I brought the sermon this morning. Oh, nope, totally lost it. Nope, there it is. <laughs> You were hoping, weren't you? Yes, okay. Um, there we go. Let me orient myself. Yes, uh, the title, there we go, is Alas, some alas have lost their visibility. I don't know if you can read all of that. Um, but I'll try and interpret here. Diane Badger, who is a friend, a colleague, and a fellow Baptist history geek, sent me a transcription of an old historical letter that was written by uh, an old pastor and included uh, at the meeting of the Old Colony Baptist Association in 1896. It was this historical letter that traced the history of the Old Colony Church back, of the Old Colony Baptist Association to the Warren Baptist Association that was begun here in uh, 1767. It talked about how the churches got together and formed these associations, and then they got to be so many churches that they had to have a few more, and eventually they broke into several of the uh, churches uh, between 1767 and Old Colony broke off in 1823, and here, this is uh, 73 years later, I was fascinated by the idea of all the Baptist churches back then and all the Baptist leaders that we have never heard about. You ever wonder what happened to Haverhill or Third Middleborough? Probably not. Hezekiah Smith, Silas Hall, Samuel Stillman. Okay, we've heard of Samuel Stillman. He was big in Boston. There was no mention in this report of Miles or Swansea whatsoever. Evidently, along with all those other churches, they had lost their visibility. Now, being slightly obsessed with our heritage, I reflected on how many Baptist churches there had been from less than 12 before 1700 to tens of thousands in the 1950s. And now today we begin to see that number dwindles. Even in my short career here in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts, we see this process of people losing their visibility, churches. While your mother church, the Swansea Congregation, was the fifth Baptist church that was organized, it's now the third oldest because many of those early congregations went through splits, dislocations, 
economic progress took the populations away. But it was this last line of the letter that took my breath away. Some, alas, have lost their visibility. I shared it with my wife, Beverly, and she had the same reaction that I did. Whoo! What a phrase! What a phrase! Some have lost their visibility. For it was so descriptive as to leave absolutely no doubt as to what the author meant. Since the beginning, congregations have ceased to function or have lost communication or shriveled into nothing more than a weathered old building in disrepair. We've all seen this, or rather, we've all not seen it anymore. What are the reasons for a disappearance? Some churches have internal disagreements and they blow up, split. People go their separate ways. Some churches have no recruitment. They're not out there inviting people. The generations where we used to have the kids, you know, come and then they would be the leaders, that doesn't happen so much anymore. Maybe it was just simply lack of funds. The people got too poor to support a pastor and a building and programs. Or maybe it was because they lacked vision. They couldn't see what the good Lord had in store for them. Now there's some external reasons as well. Populations move. Some churches were in big towns that when uh, the economic dynamics changed, the town went away, so the church went with it. There is competition from other churches, particularly those who are so evangelical they steal your sheep. Sometimes it's denominational decisions. Well, that's too small to be a church on its own. We're just going to put them over there with somebody else. Sometimes that works. And then there's just this long process of secularization. We're becoming more worldly. Pew Research says fewer and fewer are going to church or synagogue on Sunday. All of these things lead to the loss of visibility. Robert Torbett, a professor to my father and to my professors, wrote a Baptist history in the 1960s in which I read the question, is it possible to form a visible church with visible saints Saints who are visibly regenerate. This was the question that drove the first separatists who formed the ancient church in primitive order, a biblical order. And I think it's still a contemporary issue. Can we be visible to the world around us as regenerate, as as? powerful witnesses to our faith. Not just seen, but understood. Not just observed, but affirmed for what we are. Baptists have always held that their faith is a public faith, visible to the world around them so that they can invite the world to be with them. Visibility is mentioned in early Baptist covenants. <clears throat> Swansea in 1663, to walk together according to his revealed word in visible gospel relation. The Boston Confession of Faith, 1667, and those that gladly receive the word and are baptized are saints by calling and fit matter for a visible church. Bellingham, the first daughter of Swansea, 1737, so, do with, so we do with hearts and hands, lift them up to our, lift them up ourselves this day, so as many living sacrifices and being satisfied, it is our duty <coughs> 
to walk in all his ordinances and to submit to our Lord Jesus Christ, we do solemnly join ourselves together in a visible gospel church relation. And then the Baptist Church in Warren, 1764. And as it hath pleased God to appoint a visible church relations to be the way and manner whereby he is pleased to communicate to his people the blessing of his presence, a growth and grace and furtherance in the knowledge of our Lord God. Baptists witness their faith in public. In London, in Boston, in Plymouth, in Rhode Island, and all across the world throughout the ages. They witnessed their faith in public, even if it meant repression and persecution. In London, John James was drawn and quartered. Not an easy way to go. In Boston, the meeting house was boarded up. Obadiah Holmes was whipped on the Boston Common for preaching in Lynn against infant baptism. Roger Williams in Canonicus formed a colony for those of distressed conscience and gathered people in. And more contemporarily, Dr. Martin Luther King gathered thousands and called them to faith in many, wa many marches and across many pulpits. How visible are we? How do we see ourselves? Are we a historic church, struggling but healthy, really hopeful as to what's going to happen? Or how do we not see ourselves? Are we leaderless? Maybe a little confused? Maybe we're just reluctant. How do others see us? This is the big question. Are we irrelevant? Just old? Are we impotent? Are we, as Kevin has been told, a library? Are we a moral resource? How do others not see us? I know they drive by on their way to Bristol State Park down here and down to Newport and stuff. They just kind of don't see us. Oh, that's a building. Oh, nothing. And what is yet to be discovered? The perceptions versus reality is a real struggle for us. What we actually see is framed by our own biases and the parameters of our information. These days, too often, people observe the same data as others, but understand them in conflicting ways. Objective truth is a shared truth that compiles all the different ways of seeing a matter. So if we are to be seen accurately by ourselves and by others, we must be clear <coughs> We must be clear in the images, both public and private, that we create for ourselves as a congregation in order to share with the people about us, our neighbors. We cannot allow the media to portray churches or religious communities as tangential or conflicted, and certainly we do not want to be known as those people who are fading away. We cannot allow our nostalgia for what used to be to frame our future. Our vision of ourselves is critical. Also, the images that we create so people both within and beyond the congregation clearly understand who we are and what it is that we are capable of as a faith community. Whoa. A little error in printing here. Ah, there we go. The church needs to create and broadcast an image that is vital, 
relevant, and most of all, valued. But in the modern context of pandemic, polarization, and public opinion. We must never forget that any congregation is organically engaged and embedded within the geographical, economic, and social communities in which it ministers. We are a biblical people. The prophet said we are the light to the world. Here's a challenge to all the theologies that focused on the individual. The bias of most Protestant outreach for the last 200 years or so has been the conversion of individuals, which I think overshadows our need to convert to social responsibility. The often overwhelming challenge to be the light to the whole world is that we see our faith in the context of the global, even universal outreach. We who listen to Isaiah are not one against the world, but see ourselves as standing together as a global faith community. We are a corporate witness. Our mission, our outcomes, are to clearly demonstrate God's will in this world and advocate for the marginalized, the oppressed. And then Jesus said, you are like a city on a hill, a lamp on a lampstand. Get out there and shine. This image from Winthrop to Biden has been used to talk about American exceptionalism. <coughs> But it's not primarily about America. It's not about the United States of America and its history. It's about those who follow the way of Jesus as a community witness. I read this passage as a challenge to all congregations. Shine so brightly that people who live around you can see your God indwelling so that they can see the God that is inside you clearly and understandably. If there is exceptionalism, let it be that we who follow Jesus are clearly different than others. A shining example in each public and private exchange. Let our behavior, especially in public, for the public good, be indistinguishable from that which Jesus would be doing if he were here now. (coughs) Works. Let your work so shine before all men. That That will require the intention and the imagination as we develop our ministry. Public worship has always been a desired feature for Baptist Christian faith. From the hidden conventicles of the 17th century, (coughs) Baptists emerged to claim a public space. That's how come the Boston Baptists got grief. That's why the fight about taxation was so important. And that's why it was important to have meeting houses in the center of the community, which began with the first Baptist meeting house in Swansea in 1667. Just thought I'd throw that in. Extending care is part of our works, our mission. It was that mission that emerged prominently in the 18th century and continued into the 20th century. At first to convert, then to support, and then to bring resources. Adoniram Judson, his wife, went to Burma and began this process. And then, as it developed in the cities where poverty destroyed lives, men like Walter Rauschenbusch would minister to Hell's Kitchen in New York City. And others would go to foreign lands where the social and economic development was needed. 
when the public, people out there, saw these actions of selfless service, they could see faith in God in action. Justice. Nowhere is there more intention and effort needed than in the struggle for justice. Here the unseen church needs to see the unseen people. Indigenous folks, poor folks, old folks, gay folks, the handicapped, all of the people who are at the margins. Here the church must be seen acting publicly to change policies and practices that neglect those who are most in need. From Dr. King to the Baptist Joint Committee, Baptists feel the challenge and respond to the call to be public servants for socioeconomic and political justice. If the church loses its visibility, if the church and its people are not seen interacting with the public in the public's good, engaged with the contextual communities and institutions, the church loses its purpose. Seeing is believing. We used to say that, but now I think that's not always true. To make the invisible God, our first hymn this morning, immortal, invisible, God only wise. To make the invisible God shine forth, visible in a world in which observable facts and ideas are disputed, we must be a 24-7 public God presence, just, kind, and humble. We must equip ourselves to be accurate witnesses, speaking understandably to public audiences, speaking a message that is inviting, inclusive, affirming, and inspiring, as well as consistent with our historical Baptist foundation. How do we do that? Three R's. I'm really working on this for a paper that I want to write. Rediscover our roots, first R. Rediscover the foundations, that without which we cannot be what we intend to be, good biblical Christians. So we have to reclaim our historical identity as Baptists who dissented and questioned and protested and held teaching to be one of the highest values of our ministries. Baptists have always had a role in public affairs from the Philadelphia Association to <clears throat> the first pastor of this church who spoke to the Continental Congress. Bacchus who led the attack against taxing Baptists. Brown University, which has educated so many people we can't count. The Triennial Convention that opposed slavery in 1864. We need to get back to that nice, simple Baptist polity. Pastor and deacons. Don't need anything else. We need to continue our teaching. If we don't have teaching, we lose the momentum of the centuries. Our programs of learning must utilize the best educational methodologies and include the most important of our history and our theology. Though we own a significant building, a facility that expresses who we think we are and the dimensions of our faith, we must help people see the faith that sticks the people together and empowers them to serve. Second R, reclaim. Our heritage and our history as we discern the most basic values of our faith and our institution as a biblical people. Baptists fought against slavery. They fought against being taxed. They fought for religious freedom for everyone, not just Baptists. Baptists founded schools of higher education from Brown to Redlands, from Acadia to Alderson Broadus, from Colgate to Kalamazoo. Baptists separated the church from the state. 
The last R is reconstruct. To reconstruct our organization, the, the shapes and the structures of our ministry. To be appropriate to the world that is coming to be around us. But the pandemic has done nothing else. It has forced us to meet and operate in ways never before imagined. And as the cost of maintenance for a building becomes increasingly a problem, we may need to rethink our need of them. How will we recruit and train clergy and other congregational leaders? How will we persuade people to come and join our community? What function, if any, will denominations play in our development? We need discernment. We need to be able to keep what is necessary and jettison all that which will just be in the way. The challenge of discernment is great as we move forward. We need to discover ways of being seen, virtually through technologies or through the 24-7 reality with physical presence in places we all know will have an impact. How will we rebuild? How we do that will determine how we will be seen. It will be developed out of how clear our visibility and our vision of the future will be developed. That's a question that we don't have an answer for yet. It's a challenge that all of you must decide. Amen. We began to think about that time so long ago when Jesus was at table with his disciples, a time which forms us to be the followers of one who goes to the cross. Let's uh, ponder our visible gospel relations as we sing.
Shall we remain standing as we read this covenant that we make between each of us and between us and Almighty God? Having been able, by divine grace, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and having acknowledged in baptism our obligations to live a new and holy life, we do now, relying on the assistance of God, solemnly make this covenant with each other. We will walk together in brotherly love. We will exercise a Christian care and watchfulness over each other and will faithfully admonish and help one another as the need may be. We will rejoice in each other's good and with tenderness and sympathy bear each other's burdens. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together in the appointed meetings of the church, nor fail in our homes to seek in family and private prayer the blessing of God for ourselves and others. We will faithfully study this and earnestly seek to apply their teaching to our lives and to defend them before the world. We will aid, according to our ability, in the support of a Christian ministry among us and in the efforts to preach the gospel to all mankind and through life, amidst evil report and good report, will seek to glorify him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It was the Passover meal. Jesus and his followers had gathered themselves in a room uh, high above the crowds, a room prepared by his friends. It was a room in which the Passover meal was set, which they enjoyed, which they celebrated, and then uh, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, it will be broken for you. As you eat it, I will make you whole. Then as the meal finished, before they went out, after the one who was to betray Jesus was identified, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is a covenant made in my blood, poured out for you. This is the cup of our victory, all of you, let us share it. And then according to the tradition, they sang a hymn and went out.
When we leave, we want to leave with the joy that we have in our hearts, singing, clapping, and shining our love, the love that comes from God himself, into our hearts. Let us go forth clapping and shining. Amen.